All right. Welcome to challenge number six, Stamps Punch Cutting System. And um, this is really uh, kind of a kind of a departure sort of from what we've been doing so far. I guess not really a departure. It's just we're gonna encompass all things, but this is kind of these are, this is kind of a challenging category. So Let's get started first with this week's winner, though. I guess that's always a fun part to reveal that slide. So Debbie Frazier Lauer um, is this week's winner, and it just looks like she's doing a great job. And she says that, so excited. This has been wonderful for me. I've finished challenge four and five. The holding on is going to work great for me. She um, can see me scrapping a lot more. The best part is that I'm excited about organizing. I'm using it all over my home. Yay! Um, good for you, Debbie. So congratulations, and you should be hearing from Joanna with your $25 gift certificate this week. So great job, and thanks for posting your progress. All right, so let's jump right into it. Well, first, I need to give a little disclaimer. I know there's always people who are on board for the very first time. So if you are on board for the very first time, you can't see me. You can just see the PowerPoint presentation that I'm viewing on my computer screen on your computer screen, but you can't actually see me sitting here in my bunny slippers drinking coffee. Um, and um, you can't talk to me throughout the presentation, but what you can do is use the little question box that you have on your navigation pane. So if you have questions through the process, feel free to type them in at any point. Just know I won't answer them till the very end of the presentation this morning. All right, so, oh, and one other thing. I was asked by somebody, and I'm sorry, I don't remember, who you were who asked me if you could, if I could post a um, PowerPoint slide prior to the presentation beginning, which I was able to do this week, and I might have done it last week too. Um, but I will try to get those up every day be, or every session before we start. So, um, and if you don't know where those are, uh, put a note in the question box, and I'll show you where to find those on the website at the end of the presentation. So let's get started. Our goal for this webinar is to establish a system for sorting, storing, and organizing all those bulky things so that you can get the most out of them. So whether it's a physics die, a cricket cartridge, a wood-mounted stamp, whatever it is, some sort of bulky piece of equipment that you've invested a lot of money in, we want to incorporate it into our um, organization system so that you remember that you have it and that you'll actually use it. So how are we going to do that? Now, there's a lot of challenges with these things because they're all different sizes and shapes. So sometimes you have to be a little bit creative about how you're storing them. So we're going to show you a couple of different ways to store all of these things and at the same time have them incorporated into all the work that you've been doing over the last five weeks. So you have to determine for yourself, are you a got a little or a got a lot? Or you're somewhere in the middle? Do you, are you potential? Are you a got a little next? Potentially, you could be a got a lot. Um, so, got a little have a few of a variety of things. If you're a got a little, you like the stuff you have, but you're not likely to accumulate large amounts of any of it. You're more likely to use products available at your local scrapbook store when you're there to crop. Got a lot, if you're one of these, you love to have all the fun toys and feel almost like collectors. If you're a got a lot, you're very likely continue, very likely to continue to add to your collection. Your cropping top and you to have a huge variety of toys and tools to share. If you're somewhere in the middle, you can use either method as we're talking about how to do these things. Now, I'm going to talk about both the got a little and the got a lot, and I'm going to kind of bounce, bounce back and forth about ideas. So you may be a got a little when it comes to woodblock stamps, but a got a lot when it comes to cricket cartridges. So just know that you can incorporate um, different components based on how much stuff you have. You're not some got a lot or got a lot of everything, and some are not. So what are the methods we're going to use? So for got a little, we're going to try and work with an integration method, putting product representations, and in some cases, the actual product right into your four-section system. With got a lot, you're going to work off a cataloging system that will also be integrated into your four-section system, but primarily you're going to have a catalog that you can work with and add to. So let's talk about those representations for got a little. So you're, if you're got a little, you're going to create representations of each thing and put the representation into your four-section system. So as an example, if you have this stamp of a gift box that's pictured here in the lower corner, that little gift box stamp is going to work for all kinds of 
events, right? Birthday, Christmas, Hanukkah, wedding, baby graduation, retirement, anything that you might give a gift for. So in this case, I've listed six categories that I came up with where this stamp might work. So before you start this, when you look at that first little stamp or whatever, you need to think, how many places am I going to put this? You'll notice the stamp has a little 15 in the corner of it, too, on the top. That's an important clue there. So you're going to stamp this out six times, right? Make six impressions of this stamp. You're going to number the stamp or the die cut or the punch. Write the number, in this case, the stamp number on the impression. So the little impression of that gift box stamp I would write the number 15 right on the piece of paper with a gift box. Now, at one of my um, classes, somewhere along the line, somebody in the class shared a great idea with me. I, and I need to put an illustration of this, so I'm sorry I don't have one. I just would take that little gift box stamp and stamp it on a little square of paper and put the little square of paper right into my scrap rack. So in this case, you're going to put that little square of paper into your scrap rack in all six places. So birthday, Hanukkah, graduation, Christmas, whatever, right? Well, one of the um, one of my students at one class said you should cut out around the edges of that stamp. And that way, if you're building a layout, you can take that little stamp out of the pocket, the little impression of the stamp, and actually set it down on your layout and not only know that it looks good there, but you can get exactly the right size and shape of you know, matting paper or whatever it is behind it. So before, it was on a little square of paper, and I would just set it down and get a good idea. But if you take the time to actually cut around the outside of the stamp, if you're talking about these woodblock stamps, then you can really see how it's going to look on your layout. Now, I'll mention this again later, but one of the nice things about this is that if you go to a cropper class, and especially if you're using a scrap rack system, if you go to a crop and you're going to work on Christmas, and you take your Christmas section and you put it in your travel pack or however you're, you know, going. You might be taking three or four sections in a whole base unit in a tote. But whatever you're doing, when you get to the crop, you've got that little stamp impression. And you know what number stamp it is. And if it's going to work on your layout, you can just put a sticky note on your layout that says use stamp number 15 right here. Then you can build the whole layout, do everything but that stamp. And when you get home, then you can add the stamp. So you don't have to haul all of your woodblock mounted stamps with you to a crop. You don't have to haul embossing powders, tools, any of that kind of stuff. But you're still going to get maximum use out of that stamp. So you're going to spend far less time packing up, setting up, digging, and searching. But you're, really, but you're probably going to use your stamps even more. So I hope that makes sense. I wish I had some illustrations of that. Okay, I digress a little bit. Okay, so you're going to separate the impressions and put them into each of the categories. So in this case, I'm going to take that little impression and put one under B for birthday and one under G for graduation and one in uh, December under Christmas. So that as I'm flipping through, those impressions of that little gift box stamp are going to show up everywhere I might possibly use it. And then you're going to store the stamp in its proper place. And so we'll see some examples of proper place later. Um, in the presentation, but essentially with a stamp, that stamp is now number 15. It's number 15 because it's in the drawer at the top of my little stamp drawers that's labeled 1 through 25. So I know exactly where to find that stamp. I go to the drawer labeled 1 through 25, I pull it out, and then grab stamp number 15. Now, there's a whole article about this on the website, and I will put a link to it. Um, now I need to get my little notepad out here again, so I... I need to, I mean, I'll put a link to that um, article with more, it has more pictures of what I'm talking about. You're going to see more. Um, I think there's actually a video about it, too. But in the follow-up email that goes out today, I'll add a link to that stamp article so you can see even more. And so, but the beautiful thing about this is that once you start numbering things, so I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to stop now. See, I get on my little tangents. Um, so here's an example of a set of woodblock stamps, if you're using Stampin' Up, which this is. Um, but they come in a set of woodblock stamps, and they come in a little, what we call a clamshell, right? It's a great little storage container. But you can see that I've labeled these SU5, so Stampin' Up number 5, okay? So they're all together. But instead of stamping these all out, I just photocopied the whole set. And I can photocopy it multiple times. And then I can cut them apart and put them where they might belong. 
So obviously, the birthday stuff belongs in birthday, right? The wine and cheese could be an adult night out. It could be um, under family and food. Um, the Bon Appetit, I'm, we're going to put that. I have a category called <laughs> Family Food and Cooking. I think it is in my section. Bon Appetit is going to be in there. But I'm also going to put an impression of that in my Words of Wisdom section in the back so that I'll remember that I have it. So it'll pop up for me. So the thing is you can separate the same impression multiple times into a variety of categories, but you know exactly where to go. When I'm looking for this um, SU-5 stamp, I go right to my Stampin' Up! basket, and it's just in there labeled SU-5, and I can pull it out. I know exactly where it is, and I can actually get a really good use out of it. So why are we numbering these things? So numbering things like your stamp Hunters Cricut prevents constantly rearranging to fit like products into the correct area. Um, it also allows you fast, easy access to find something. It also makes it really easy to put things away. Yay! If it's easy, you'll do it. So I, I know I've said that many, many times through this process, but keep that in mind. Things have to be easy and accessible, and then you'll put them away. They won't end up being in a pile or getting buried under other things. If it's easy, you'll do it. Okay, so um, when I say numbering things like stamps and punches prevents constantly rearranging to fit like products in into the correct area, what does that mean? Do you guys all feel like I'm talking really fast today? I need to take a breath, I guess. Okay, so imagine, if you will, <laughs> your woodblock stamps, which now are probably arranged by category. So you have your drawers or shelves or whatever you have of woodblock stamps or boxes, and you have all your beach stamps together, and your baby stamps together, and your birthday stamps together. And your beach stamp box or drawer is full but you buy some more beach stamps. Well, now you have to spend a couple of hours trying to figure out how to rearrange your baby stamps or your birthday stamps to fit in these extra beach stamps so that you can keep everything together in alphabetical order. Or you have to go out and buy another container, a bigger container, to fit all of your beach stamps. And that container's not going to work with the baby stamps and the birthday stamps or whatever it is. So what you end up doing is buying all these containers and constantly rearranging your products so that you can fit them all in with like products. Well, when you start using impressions or a catalog, you don't have to do that anymore. So we had that little gift box stamp. It was stamp number 15, right? We put the impressions everywhere it would belong in our four-section system, and we put the stamp in drawer number 1 through 25, and right on the woodblock stamp, I label it on all, like, all four sides of the woodblock and the top with that number 15. So it doesn't matter how I put it in the box, upside down, right side up, backwards, forwards, I can always see the 15. So that's another little tip right there. But now when you buy a new beach stamp, right, if all your, if you have 200 stamps, and this is stamp number 201, and, let, and it's another beach stamp, you can take that stamp, let's say it's a beach ball. You can take that beach ball stamp, give it the number 201, stamp out the number of impressions that you need. So for a beach ball, you obviously you're going to put it under beach. You might put it under summer. It's a ball, so you might put it under sports. Um, it could be really cute and on a baby page, so you might put an impression under baby. So now you've got four places that you might use that. You stamp out four impressions. You write number 201 on all the impressions, file them wherever you might use them, and now you just add that stamp to the end of the line. So whether it's the last drawer or the last box or the last shelf or whatever it is, you don't have to rearrange everything else trying to keep that beach ball with the other beach stuff. The other thing that happens when you do it this way is if you bought that beach ball just thinking about beach and you put it under beach, then when you're doing a baby page where it might work perfectly, you won't see it. You probably won't remember that you have it. But now when you're working on baby, whether that's a card or a page or a frame, and you flip to baby, you're going to see that little beach ball, and it might be the perfect thing to go on that um, baby project. So I hope that all makes sense. I know I get kind of excited about this, and I start talking to my ultimate. So. Now, if you're a god a lot, you probably need to create a catalog instead of just impressions. And if you're somebody who's teetering on the edge, and you think that you're a god a little now, but that you're probably going to end up being a god a lot, then I would recommend doing a catalog also. Um, or instead of. Um, it's nice to have both, actually, but it's a lot of work to do both. So the catalog is going to serve you well if you think you're going to become a god a lot in the future. 
So creating a catalog that's an actual standalone catalog of your stuff is the way to go if you're a god a lot. Your catalog is going to follow the four section system. It's actually only three sections because you don't have the rainbow section. The catalog can easily be transported to crops and classes and even on shopping trips. You'll buy products that complement rather than duplicate what you already own. Imagine that. But think about it, especially for those of you who are crazy stampers, right? You have tons and tons of stamps. And sometimes you'll go to a Close to My Heart event or a Stampin' Up event or even to the local rubber stamp store and you'll buy a stamp. Let's say it's a heart-shaped stamp. And you think, this is the right heart-shaped stamp for me. I have one that's bigger and I have one that's smaller. I need this medium heart. And when you get it home, you discover, hey, guess what? I already have one this exact same size. I needed one that was larger or smaller or whatever. Well, if you have a catalog of all your stamps that you can just grab off your scrap rack or off your shelf, however you're creating it, and take it with you to an event, then you can go to Valentine's Day or Hearts or wherever you have them cataloged and look at exactly what you've got and make sure that you're buying exactly what you need. So there's all kinds of benefits for that, right? First of all, you're not duplicating stuff. But second of all, if you were going to use that heart for a particular project that you, and so you went to the rubber stamp store and bought it, then you came home and got all ready to do the project and realized it wasn't the right thing, now you have to go all the way back to the stamp store and get another one or call your rep or whatever you need to do. So having that catalog to be able to take with you to events makes it a lot easier. Um, and again, you're buying things that complement rather than duplicate what you already own. I know none of you out there in the listening audience today have ever bought the same thing twice. I'm sure of it. None of us would ever do that. Okay, so if you're a god a lot or you're on the verge of becoming a god a lot, you need to decide your catalog format. So you can either use 12 by 12 format or you can use an 8.5 by 11 format. In either case, you're going to need paper, page protectors, hole reinforcers, a three-hole punch maybe, um, and some type of divider. Um, if you're a god a lot, now, now as we start to get everything together, as we do that second step, the gather step. So if you're a god a little, you should bring all of your stamps and punches together in one place. If you don't have a lot of tools, these kinds of tools, you can use this one numbering system for all of them, right? So we tend to number Usually when people do these catalog things, they number their punches, you know, like P, 1 through 10, or, and their woodblock stamps differently, and their Sizzix dies differently, or whatever. Um, but if you don't have a lot, then you can number things all together, especially things like um, punches and woodblock stamps. So you'll see a little bit of that as we go on. But now, if you've got a lot, you want to start with one type of product and bring all of those things together and work in small groups. Really, really important. This is a task that's time consuming and can be overwhelming. So stick with that small group, like one little plastic shoe box of stamps or, you know, one box of Cricut cartridges at a time or whatever, just so that you can stay um, focused, get that little piece done, and then move on to the next thing so that you're not getting overwhelmed. All right, so then you have to decide how you're going to store these things. How and where are you going to store your sorted items? and get those things together. So whether it's boxes, scrap rack pages, drawers, or shelves, again, you want to prepare an organized only space for the sorted items so that as you take care of them, you have a place to put them. So some god may need to create a code list if you have tons of stuff. So here are some examples of what I'm talking about. WB Woodblock, WBK Woodblock Kit. So like my Stampin' Up Kit is a Woodblock Kit. Um, all my Stampin' Up! kits are, so I didn't need to use that on those. Um, uh, acrylic unmounted Stampin' Up! These are just some keys that you can use to know where to go to find those items or exactly what they are. It's not necessary. Again, it just depends on how much stuff you have. Okay, so starting the process. Go through one container at a time. Stamping, punching, copying. Uh, as you saw, I copied my stamps onto the catalog sheets, encoding and numbering the products and their representation. When you're finished, label the containers where you stored the catalog items with the numbers. So, you know, if you're working through 1 through 15, don't label the box until everything's in the box, right? You don't want to go through and say, I'm going to put 25 stamps in each box, and then come to find out you can only put 20 stamps in this box, but the next box of stamps is smaller, so you can fit, fit, fit 30. So, um, you know, just fill the box first and then label it. So here's some examples of what those catalog sheets might look like. So on the back 
left, you see a yellow catalog sheet, and that is the 12 by 12 catalog. It's stored in a super-sized single um, pocket page. You could three-hole punch it if you wanted to. It's a little bit harder to three-hole punch when you're trying to line up on 12 by 12 because most three-hole punches don't allow. I mean, you have to kind of fudge it in there, so it's easier to put it in just a super-sized single. But you can see it's the animals page. So if I have an animals section in my theme section, then I'm going to have an animals catalog page with stamps or punches uh, or physics dies or whatever that relate to animals. And then you can see that in this animals page, the stamps are numbered on that page, right? So these are acrylic stamps. I just put them on the copy machine and photocopy them. Why did I do that? Because then I didn't have to clean them all. Right? I didn't have to stamp them out and clean them all. So I just laid them on the photocopier and did draft copies. So I just printed them out really fast. And then on the right side, that's an 8.5 by 11 catalog. It's actually created. Uh, for me by somebody who took the class, and this is a combination of stamps and punches. So you can see that those are all her beach um, stamps and punches there, and there's little numbers in the corner of each of her little squares about what, what number or what drawer that particular stamp is in. So with the numbers on the yellow sheet on the previous page, the catalog sheet, you can see this is number 12, 109, 12, 112, 6102, 6101, that, those unmounted stamps are in a whole unmounted stamp section of my scrap rack. So in the front I have the stamp catalog and then that's followed with the stamp. And the numbers 12, 6, and 4, which is a little bit confusing, the numbers indicate the number of stamps or the number of pockets on a page. So. The 12 would be the Dream Dozen page, which we don't make anymore. Sorry, I should probably change this picture out. Now it's uh, 16. They would all be in the Sweet 16. But that, the first two numbers on my impressions here tell me which section I can find those stamps in. So the ones that start with 12 are going to be under the 12 tab, and the ones that start with 6 are going to be under the 6 tab. And um, by doing that, I'm able to maximize the um, use of the scrap rack pages, right? So you want to number your pages first, number all the pockets first, and as you fill in the pockets, give the stamp the number that, of the pocket that it's going to go in. The nice thing about using the scrap rack pages, I'm not sure if I have a picture of it here. So yeah, okay, so this one changes. So you can see I changed when we switched to the 16, the Sweet 16 pocket. I renumbered the stamps and put them into the Sweet 16 page. So there you go. That's what it looks like. So I just use a file folder label and cut them into thirds and stuck them on each pocket. Now you can write directly on the pocket with a Sharpie if that's what you want to do. The reason I didn't do that is because since you can see through all the pockets, if you just write on the pocket, if the stuff's coming through in the back, it's not as um, easy to read as it is with just a little sticker. But these are just the little um, stickers from Office Depot or wherever for file folder labeling. So here's a couple of examples of Stampin' Up! and Close to My Heart. Now, Close to My Heart comes in those little plastic um, little plastic envelopes. And you can just put a number on the envelope and then put them in the basket. And I'll be honest with you, I now have my Close to My Heart stamps in the Fabulous Four page um, so that they're all together with everything else. And I only have woodblock stamps in the basket. But you can see SU number five in the picture on the upper left, voila, that's that um, cooking stamp set. So any of these stamps that I wanted to use, um, I, when I found the picture, I would know this is Stampin' Up! one through nine. I could go in there and find whichever Stampin' Up! set that I needed. Now, some of the Stampin' Up! sets come with, you can see the little love diagram on the upper right side there. Um, those are all the stamps in that love kit. Well, instead of putting all the stamps on the copier, you can just photocopy that love kit, or you can leave it and cut them apart. In this case, you could leave them all together because they're all the same. Now, there is this little one that says thank you on it. And so I would move that into my sentiment section, my thank you section also, so that if I was doing a thank you card or something, I would remember that I had that. So I would put that example in there as well. Another option is to use a photo storage box and photo files. The new photo storage box and files are a little bit oversized, so they work great for storing stamps or nestabilities or even embossing folders. Um, 
So you can put them in that box, same thing, just number the front of the box, use the file folders to segment them off, and you can, so you can see, you know, what's in each one. You'll still want to add examples of these items to your four section system and your catalog sheets. Just remember your photo storage boxes and your file folders, and then put the court, just number, sorry, um, the photo storage boxes and file folders, and then put the corresponding number in the catalog. So it's the same basic system. Now, the same, we're going to do the same thing with your Cricut cartridges, okay? So, and I have some more pictures. So if you don't want to keep your Cricut cartridges in the boxes because, and I'll show you an example of how to catalog the boxes, but um, because they take up too much space or they're not very transportable or any of those kind of things, there's a lot of good ways to store the Cricut cartridges. So this box on the left side holds 16 cartridges, some of your tools in your booklets and overlays. Now, one of the things you can do with your booklets and overlays is remove the foreign language section. So if you don't need all the French and German instructions in your Cricut, cart in your Cricut booklet, if you remove those, it just makes the booklets a lot lighter to carry around and a lot thinner to carry around. Some people don't like to take those out because they think, you know, at some point I may sell the cartridge and maybe I'm going to sell it to a foreign speaker, so they might need that. But if you know you're going to keep them, you can go ahead and take those foreign language sections out. Um, so if you are using the box on the left, and there's a video about using this also on the website, um, I would number the tray, or I did number the tray because I have one of these boxes. I would number the tray 1 through 16, and I would number the cartridges 1 through 16, number the front of the box 1 through 16, and then when I put the impression of what's on that Cricut cartridge, so let me scoot ahead. So the boxes are on our website. I'll send out a link to them in the cool tools section. And then the um, cartridge page, of course, is just in the pages section on our website. So the other thing about that Cricut cartridge page is the pockets on it are, have a deep gusset in them. So I think if you read the blog post that I did when I scrapbooked on vacation, I literally took one of those cartridge pages and I was able to put ink and chalk and pens and all kinds of bulky stuff into those pages and throw it in my travel pack. So it was a great way to haul little loose things that didn't actually, that wouldn't actually fit into a four section system that I wanted to have with me. So, and then Merle doubled up on her, uh, on her Cricut cartridge pages. So she's put two cartridges and two booklets and two overlays in each pocket. Okay, so, and here's another idea, a great way to take a divider and add, um, pieces of Velcro and then add little Velcro dots to the back of your cartridges. And again, if you number your cartridges and then you number the divider, so you write on the divider tab, you know, cartridges 1 through 25, then you have all of those cartridges together and you can just flip to that page and see all of your Cricut cartridges and find exactly the number one that you want. So here's what I would do in terms of cataloging these though. This is the full color. Um, uh, printout of everything that's on um, Cricut cartridge number 101. And you can see the numbers in the background, CA101, which means Cricut Alphabet 101, and CT, which means Cricut um, Steam, I think, yeah, Cricut Steam. So the two things, um, these particular boxes are kept separated by alphabets and themes. You don't have to do that. You could number your boxes because you're, you know, one through, 300 or whatever you've got because you're going to put a number on the impression. So in this case, this impression, this picture of everything that's on CA 101, um, it's an alphabet themed font making the grade. So I would do, I would take a photocopy of this off the back of the box. Now some people like to use the information that's on the inside of the booklet. I'm not as concerned about that. The back of the box is going to give me a pretty good idea of everything I can make with that cartridge, and it's in color. So I'm going to put a couple boxes on my printer, and I'm going to, or my, you know, whatever, photocopy, copy, skin, print, blah, 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 print, scan, whatever it's called these days. I'm going to put a couple boxes on there, photocopy them in color so I can see all the different um, dimensions or all the different layers on, on things. And then, so this one, with this first one, CA101, I would put a copy of this in the alphabet section, right, in the first section. And then I would also put a copy of it in the school section. For me, school's in September. Some of you probably have school under themed S, but wherever that school thing is. And that way, whether you're working 
on something where you need an alphabet or whether you're working on something that's school related, it's going to pop up for you and you're going to remember what it is. You're going to be able to go right to your shelf and grab that CA 101. Now, if you just had these in your in the storage pages or in you know in the um, Cricut box, then you would just put the number of the cartridge. So if this is cartridge number 15 in the box in box number one, which would be um, cartridges one through 16, you know exactly what box to go to. You know exactly what slot it's in. You know exactly where the booklet is, and you can grab that cartridge and that booklet quickly and easily. Now, I would really recommend that you number the front of your booklet and the right on the cartridge the number as well. And again, then you know exactly which thing you're pulling out, you know exactly where to put it away when you're done. I hope that makes sense. So here's that catalog again of the punches and stamps um, and then the drawers that go with it. So she actually has on the front of her drawers one, uh, one of each of the um, examples of the punch or stamp that's in the drawer. And then the um, the catalog follows the drawer number. So the little butterfly stamps would be in drawer number 11. I can't see the drawer numbers um, on here. I'm not even sure that 11 is pictured there. But um, so it makes it really simple. If you want to use those flower stamps, you know exactly where those flower punches, you know exactly where to go to find them. So just coordinating the drawer number, which I kind of talked about earlier, with the example number, whether it's in a catalog or it's just an example in your scrap rack in the four section system is going to lead you directly back to that item. Start a catalog page even if you only have one thing that fits that category. So in this catalog, on these catalog sheets, you can see this gal has lots of party stamps, but only one sports stamp. It's stamp number 78. Um, so don't say, oh, I only have one sports stamp. I'm not going to start that catalog section. Go ahead and start the catalog section even though you just have one stamp, right? You want to just stick to it and then give that stamp a number, put it in the drawer where it belongs, and you're ready to go. Same thing with embossing folders. Make examples of the embossing folders and put them where they would go. And then you can put your embossing folders. I used a um, fabulous four page, but you could use the some you could use a box like our photo storage box and the numbered file folders or you could put them in some other kind of container. But as long as they're numbered and the examples are numbered and in your four section system, then you're actually going to use them. So this, you know, you have this one number EF106, which is numbers. So I would make a couple of impressions of that. One of them I put in the alphanumeric section and one of them I put in the birthday section. You've got bricks and wood. Well, bricks and wood could, would both be in home or construction if you're building something. Um, wood would I would put the wood one also in camping or outdoors or nature. So if you make multiple examples and spread them around in your four section system and then give yourself some direction, where is that? Oh, it's in the EF section 102. Then you're actually going to see it. You're going to remember that you have it, and you're actually going to use it. Now, you can also put right in that little section if you had some um, little sample of what what you wanted to do with that. So if you found a little article in the pa in the magazine about how to use that or how to ink that wood impression so that it really looked like wood, if you put that right in with the embossing folder in that pocket, then when you actually go to use that, you're going to remember that piece of information and actually use it. So anything that you can incorporate into that, um, into those pockets or into those examples that's going to lead you to use your information or your products better, you should be throwing it in there with everything else. So here's an example of the little color bag embossing folders also. And those are just in the Sweet 16. Okay, so this week's challenge. Catalog 20 things a day for the next seven days, 140 items over the course of the next week. Now this is something that someone else can help you with too, the actual creation of the catalog pieces. So if you can recruit some help here, you could do that. And then you want to continue the process. So you can continue through the process by doing a little each week until everything is cataloged, or you can catalog things as you use them. So what I what I mean by that is if you let's say you're do, you've done your 140 items and next week you think, oh I'm gonna you know do another 20 or I'm gonna spend two hours doing this. But in the meantime you sit down and work on soccer pages and for, because of that you've pulled out your 
you know, soccer cartridge or your sports cartridge that hasn't been cataloged yet or a soccer stamp that hasn't been cataloged yet, once you use it, because you're going to number things and put them away, every time you use something, you can add it to your catalog. So you've already got that stamp out. It's already inked up. You're already going to have to clean it. If it's going to work in multiple places, go ahead and stamp it out in multiple places, give it a number, and then file it away. So once you've cataloged it and given it a number, you can put it right into the box numerically or in the drawer or in the uh, file folder or wherever it is because it's been cataloged. I hope that makes sense. So there's a couple of things that come to mind with this cataloging process. And there are kind of two schools of thought. And the first one is, if I haven't cataloged it, if I come across it and I haven't cataloged it, it's because I don't use it and I could probably get rid of it. All right? So that's how some people think about it after a certain amount of time. And then the other way to think about it is the reason I haven't used it is because it wasn't in my catalog. And if I had seen it, if it had popped up for me in that catalog, then I probably would have used it. So as you go into this process, you want to think about those kind of things. How am I going to determine whether this is something I should keep? or um, something that I should probably put into my purge box or my garage sale box or whatever it is. So remember that purge box is a, now a permanent fixture in your craft area. So um, you should be adding to it each time you do a little bit of crafting and moving things out that you know you're not going to use anymore or scraps or whatever it is that you've got. So, All right, so I'm going to open up the question pane and we will get started answering questions today. Um, let's see, I'm going to move my, oops, um, I know this question pane thing is kind of a pain. You guys can't see it on your screen, so, but it is kind of a pain. Okay, Debbie says, I am looking for the paper storage boxes. Yes, um, well, actually what will happen, Debbie, is when they come back in stock, we won't have them again until January. I actually just brought in the Copper Hopper vertical paper storage um, boxes so that people have something available to them. And um, I'll send out a link to the new boxes. I'm writing myself a note here. Um, so you can see them and the dividers that come with them. Now the dividers that Copper Hopper make fit in our already in our cardboard boxes. If you already have the cardboard boxes and you don't want to make your own dividers or cut up our dividers because ours are too big for the boxes, the Copper Hopper ones do fit in the uh, cardboard paper storage boxes. Now, the Copper Hopper ones are a nice quality box. The problem with the Copper Hopper boxes is they're $8 a piece. So they're a little bit more expensive. You know, one of the nice things about our boxes is you get five of them for $18. And um, they're cardboard, so you can decorate them to match your room. So those options aren't available with the Copper Hopper boxes, but they are a good quality box. If you're looking for paper storage, it is available that way, or you can wait till January. What will happen, I'm sorry, I strayed from the question. What will happen, Debbie, is when the, this product comes back in stock, we're going to offer it, as we always do, um, with a 10% discount for anybody who's been waiting. So you don't have to worry about the Get Organized um, challenge code, we'll send it out with the same because it has been out of stock, so anybody that's been waiting will be able to take advantage and get a little discount. So thanks for asking about that. I probably wouldn't have mentioned it. Um, Melanie says, I wish I could catalog all the designs I have for my Silhouette cutting system, but until Silhouette puts it into the software, I can't. I can't. It's really annoying. I have over 1,500 designs. Um, I'm not totally familiar with the Silhouette, Melanie, but you can probably create a catalog using OneNote, right? So um, if you give those, I'm not sure how Silhouette works. I mean, there might be somebody else that's more familiar with it. But you probably can, collect, can create a digital catalog for them using OneNote. So you don't have to print them all out or whatever. You can just um, create a catalog. If you haven't watched the OneNote webinar, you might find that helpful about how to create um, a digital organize your digital ideas using um, OneNote. So I, and that might be a good option for you, too. Well, hello, Lavie. Hi, it's Lavie. How are you? I'm a god a lot plus. How would you organize Cricut cartridges in the four sections or alphabetical fonts, images, or something else? I've got much more than 100, and it's hard to know what is where. So that's why exactly she asked this question before we got to the Cricut cartridge, but that's exactly why you want to give, just give them a number 
and then make multiple impressions of that um, of that cartridge and put them wherever you can use them so that you do get maximum use out of those. Um, Don says, I was wondering if, if it was normal at this point to be purging more than organizing. Um, I think, Don, if you are purging more than organizing, you're on a great track. We all have so much stuff, and all that stuff sort of bogs you down. I mean, if you if you have a hundred items, but you are, you're only using ten of them. But you have to dig through ninety to get to that ten every time. Those ninety items are picking up your space, your energy, sapping your creativity, wasting your time, all that stuff. So I'm all for purging. The other thing about purging is that when you find something you really love that you have a, a project in mind for that you actually need then you're going to feel good about buying it because you know exactly what you've got in your left in your collection. So you purge, girl. You go for it. That's the best way to go if you ask me. Danita says, wow, I have been doing this for a while, and it really helps to find the stamps that I need. Nice to be validated. Yay, good job, Danita. It's the only way to go with stamps because they're so bulky and so hard to store. Livy says, as far as stamp organization, it has been killing me because my mind didn't want to work that way. But it has been the best exercise of the challenge because I now know what I have of everything and having the choice is excellent. I work much faster now. All the clear stamps hang on my clip it up and the boxed ones are in a basket. The wooden ones are in a series of shelves. Thanks for broadening my horizons. You are so welcome. I'm glad that it's working for you. Barbara says, um, what if it comes in a stamp like in a set like Stamp It Up? Oh, you just answered my question, she says. Melanie says, LOL, I wonder how many of us unconsciously took a deep breath when you did. I <laughs> know, uh, I get kind of, I get so excited about it. Shauna says, I photocopied each index set, the labels, before I adhere them to the stamps and keep a copy in the PlayCon box. Helps me know if this stamp is missing and what and what it is. With the numbering system, you can easily add the stamps before you make the first you can easily add the number before you make first copy. Great point, Shauna, and I forgot to mention that, too. So um, it is nice that if you have that example in the box or in the back of the um, page, and I have, when you, if you look at the stamp article or, or um, video that's on the website, there's an example, a couple of examples of that. Especially if you, if you buy the um, acrylic stamps, and uh, they come with, sometimes in the little $1 stamps, a, a picture of the stamp on the back, and you can just put that picture right in the pocket page. Um, and you can also put a little note in the pocket page then. So I lent a stamp to Karen, like a little bicycle or something. I put a note, lent to Karen and the date, and then I put that in the pocket where the stamp belongs. So um, when she returns the stamp, I'll throw it away, but if she forgets to bring the stamp back, then I can say to her, hey, you've got this bicycle stamp, you know, bring it in or whatever. So um, it does help for those kind of things too. Or if you take a bunch of stamps out to go do something um, and you put them in a tote, you can put in your own little note that says, you know, I took these, you know, into my kid's class on Valentine's Day. I lent these all to the teacher or whatever. And then you know where they are and you know when, when and where to go to get them back. So it does make it really helpful. Um, and then there's some questions about amount of stamps, which we covered, I think. Um, what is the advantage of sorting by manufacturer, i.e. Stampin' Up! versus Close to My Heart? Thank you, Barbara. So here's the thing, Barbara. When I first started, obviously my Stampin' Up! stamps are woodblock stamps, right? So those aren't going to fit with my unmounted Close to My Heart stamps anyway. So those ended up in their clamshells in the basket. And when I first started that with Close to My Heart, I put those, because they came in those plastic envelopes, I numbered the envelopes and put them in the Close to My Heart basket. Well then, as I started organizing into my scrap rack pages, especially the smaller stamps and the little the sets of stamps that come from Basic Gray were like more of a four by six, so they fit in the perfect six thing, I thought to myself, why do I have my close to my heart stamps separated from all the rest of the stamps? That's just silly. And at that point, I renumbered the close to my heart stamps, put them in the fabulous four pages, and I actually put them back to back. So you know how close to my heart comes with that little foam pad in there. So I put two close to my heart stamps in each of the pocket pages so I can see one on the front side of the page. When I flip the back, other side of the page, I see the other set of stamps. Now it makes the page pretty heavy and it has a little bit of bag to it in that case, 
But what happened was, instead of having to get up, go over, flip through all the little folders for close to my heart to find the one that I needed, I could just flip to the stamp section on my scrap rack, go to that four tab, and you know, grab whatever I needed out of there. So it really brought everything together for me. So with um, acrylic stamps or unmounted stamps, if you're a god a lot, I put them all in scrap rack pages because you can get so many of them in such a small space and it's totally transportable without disrupting your organization system. And then of course Stampin' Up, I just kept separately because there were woodblock stamps. And I probably won't buy woodblock stamps anymore. Well, I haven't, I haven't bought woodblock stamps in a long time, mostly because of the storage issues that surround them. So. I went on a little long for that. I hope that helped. Um, and then Barbara talked about if I buy a stamp through a catalog, I cut the catalog photo and copy and use that pick in color of whatever and maybe uh, idea card or use them. That's a great idea. So if the stamp is pictured in a catalog, especially because you, it's going to be a completed impression where you can really see the colors that were used or whatever, Cut up that catalog and put it right in with the stamp. Great idea, Barbara. Kim says, I am very confused on the stamp organization. Not sure why. Do you file the unmounted stamps in the scrap rack with all the other stuff, or do you have a separate system for the stamps since they come in so many different forms? Thanks so much, Kim. It depends, Kim, if you're got a lot or got a little. So if you're got a lot or you're into stamping and you have lots of stamps, then I would just put the stamps in using the straight numbering system in individual scrap rack pages. But if you just have a few rubber stamps, so sometimes you'll buy a collection of products and inside that collection of products there'll be one or two of those little like dollar size rubber stamps. I have this for Halloween, right? Um, I forget, the Imaginats had these little one dollar Halloween stamps that went with the paper and stickers and everything else that came together. And so I put those little stamps <coughs> before I had very many stamps actually, into my Halloween section. So if you don't, if you're not a stamper, but you've accumulated a few of those little $1 stamps, then they go right into the, by the section that you're going to use them in, and you might, have make, you might make impressions of them to go, so in other categories, if they fit in other categories, in this case the Halloween stamps only fit in Halloween, but, so it just depends where you are. If you've got a little, insert your, acrylic unmounted stamps right in the section where they belong, and if you're a got a lot, put them in, in um, scrap rack pages um, following the catalog numbers. Um, uh, Shauna says, would love another buy one, get one for the photo storage boxes to help with this week's challenge. I'll have to see if Karen's up for that. You never know. I'll ask her. Julie says, I have all my Cricut cartridges stored on a Gypsy, so my cartridges and boxes are stored away, and I just use a Gypsy. Do you have any suggestions on numbering those? I'm not sure if you're talking about numbering, somehow numbering the impressions on the Gypsy, or if you're talking about numbering the boxes that are stored away. So if you give me a little bit more information, Julie, I'm happy to answer that. Beatrice says, what about silhouette images on my computer that print on the silhouette? How do I organize them? Would I print each of them? and then reference them to the name in the computer. You can either print them. I don't know how, tech, how, how technical you all are. So people who are super techie, you can use a OneNote type program or an Evernote type program so that your silhouette images are on your phone and on your iPad and on your computer. Um, I would really recommend taking a look at that OneNote webinar that's on the website. I think it's on the website. I'll see if I can find a link to it if it's not. Um, it's definitely on YouTube if it's not on the website. And, um, and cataloging using OneNote so that when you, if you work with a computer handy in your craft room, you can go into your OneNote digital catalog and find that silhouette image. Now you may want to print them out also if, you know, some of us are paper people and we like to be able to actually tangibly look through things rather than always relying on an iPad or a um, laptop or the phone or whatever it is that we're using. But I would definitely do the same thing with a digital catalog. If it's a silhouette image that works, you know, start that digital catalog system and just cop photoco or copy that image into each category where it might work and give it a number. I'm not totally familiar with the silhouette, um, so I'm not sure how totally how that works. And somebody else who's in the group that has already done a challenge may have a silhouette and may have also been using the OneNote 
method to um, organize. So hopefully somebody can post up on Facebook if you um, have a good, a better idea of how that works than I do. Trish says, what is the best way to store the big honkin' We Are Memory Keepers 8 punches? Same way. Just punch out examples of them, give them a number, hang them on the wall, or hang them, um, I'm trying to think, I just saw those somewhere, somebody had them somewhere that was, I thought was kind of a cute way that they had them put away. I think they had them hung over something, like a, almost like a clothesline or something, if I'm remembering cor correctly. But the nice thing about it is, about numbering them, is that like with those big honking punches, you don't have to have them turn so you can see what's on them if you just give them a number and make impressions of them and put them in the catalog, right, or, um, in your catalog. Or you can put them in a drawer numbered also. The thing is, if you think, oh, I want to make this um, star border from the big eight, one of the big eight punches, that's number, punch number 12, if it's in your catalog, you'll remember that you have it, and then you'll use it. Um, so getting it in the catalog is key, and then, then you can put them in a drawer on a shelf or something where they're not quite as um, visible because you're not using the punch itself to remind you of what it is. I hope that makes sense. Amy says, I'm so confused. I have a ton of Stampin' Up! stamps. I have all the Christmas stamps on the top shelf, one of my two cabinets. I store them in the clamshells. Do I like catalog SU1, SU2 on the cases? Also, their embossing folders are like shapes, stripes, paisleys, basic backgrounds, embossing folders. What do I do with those? Also, do you put the catalog pages in the front of the scrap rack? So let's start with the first one. Um, Yes, just give the clamshells a number. I literally use, again, those file folder tabs because, I, I don't know, you could write right on the Stampin' Up! clamshell if you want, I guess, too. But I just put the file folder tab sticker right on the clamshell and wrote the Stampin' Up! number on it. And then I would just photocopy all those stamps and throw them into your catalog, you know, so you're going to have you're, you're going to have all your Christmas stamps kind of in numerical order to start with because that's already how you have them, right? Um, but then when you buy another Christmas stamp, if you have, you know, 50 Stampin' Up! sets and the first 15 are Christmas, but you buy number 51, you're not going to work it into that top shelf. You're going to take an impression of it, you're going to put it in the Christmas section, and you're going to write, you know, SU51, and then it's going to go in the, at the end of the line. So you're not going to spend a bunch of time rearranging stuff all the time. You're going to give it a number and put it at the end of the line. Okay, so I hope that answers question number one. Um, the embossing folders are shapes, stripes, paisleys, just background embossing folders. Yes, they are. So you might have a whole section um, uh, in your catalog that's just called background. Because not only do embossing folders come that way, but also stamps come that way, right? So I have a bunch of close to my heart stamps that are just random designs. So you may have just a background um, section for stamps and embossing folders where you're putting a replica of that um, stamp. So let's, let's talk about the wood one, right? The wood one is obviously wood, but that could be used as a background on so many things. It doesn't necessarily have to be wood related, right? It could obviously be used if you're doing a camping pages or a camping card with a forest theme or if you're doing some kind of construction thing, but it might be a great background for a Father's Day card as well or an Earth Day card or any of those kind of things. So you want to put it where it would work as a theme, but also you want to put it in that background section so that you'll remember that it's there. The same thing if you have something that has like happy squiggly lines on it, and when you look at that embossing folder, you go, oh, look at these happy squiggly lines. These scream out birthday to me. So you're going to put an example of that embossing folder under birthday or under celebration or whatever, and then you're also going to put an example of it in your catalog under background. So that's the beautiful thing about cataloging is that anywhere that you might possibly think you could ever use that design, you can just put an example of it in that section. And then when you're doing something where you don't know what you're doing, you know you just need a background, you can go to the background sections and you can see all the different backgrounds that you've got in one place. I hope that makes sense too. Okay, so. Um, also, do you put the catalog pages in the front of the scrap rack? Yes, that's exactly where my catalog pages are um, in the front of my scrap rack. Actually, they're, they're not in the front of my scrap rack. They're actually between where themes end and the rainbow starts in my catalog, in my scrap rack. And the reason they're there is because arms reach to my 
um, scrap rack, that's exactly the position where my hand reaches over into my scrap rack. And that's something that I use really commonly. So it divides for me the rainbow section and the theme section. I hope that makes sense. Um, uh, how do you file border stamps? Same way. We just talked about backgrounds. So you need a border section, right? Because especially for things like spellbinders. Because there's tons of borders in spellbinders. And some of the borders are things like Christmas lights. And so those are going to be in the Christmas section, right? But think about those Christmas lights, right? Look, so the thing that the one I'm thinking of right now is a strand of classic Christmas lights. And so that's obviously going to go in Christmas. But you could also put it in borders because you might use it for something else. So if you went to some sort of party um, or you're making a page that's like outdoor summer party or whatever, you might use that just with all like white light bulbs or whatever in it. Or you might use it on a card for something. So a border section, and I think truthfully if you look at mine, mine is called backgrounds and borders. So things that are really generic, flourishes and squiggly lines and dots or whatever, um, they're all in there at the same time. Now, we didn't talk too much about the spellbinders dies. Um, spellbinders dies are a little bit more difficult to store, especially the nestability, because all those little pieces nest together. So there's, there is actually a, um, an article and possibly a video. I can't remember if we did a video on it as well. With the spellbinder dies, if you just get a piece of magnetic cloth from, um, you can use a vent cover. Uh, you can go to Home Depot or wherever and get a magnetic vent cover, and it just comes in this big sheet of magnet that's flexible. You can buy it's called magnetic cloth. You can buy it at Michaels or Joanne in the general crafts area. And then I just cut the pieces of magnetic cloth to fit in the different pocket pages that I had Nestability dies for, and I stuck all the dies right on that magnetic cloth and slipped them into the pocket. So you can do the same thing um, even if you're using a box or whatever to store your Nestability dies in. If you get that magnetic cloth and just stick the dies right to it, then um, they'll all stay together and they'll stay nice and neat and tidy and you can file them away. So it's a great way to do that. I will put a little, I'm going to put a Nestability, uh, I'll put a link here to the Nestabilities place on the website too. So if you have those, you can see them. Um, is there an area on the website where I can see the samples again? Yes, I'm going to send. Well, I'm going to send some links out um, in the follow-up email that'll come out today or tomorrow, and that'll link that. But in the learn section of the website, well, let's go there and check it out. So, if you go, I have my thing here blocking me. If you go to the learn section, um, I think this nest abilities organization organize them in your scrap rack 101. Um, so this kind of takes you through the process. Oh, see, and there is a video of how to put them on the mat and then measure to make sure they're going to fit in whatever pocket and then cut the mat, and then there they are just in a scrap rack pocket. But if you go to this section right here, this Learn tab, um, that's where most of the information is stored. And some of it's been up there for a while. Looking to see Sweet Stamp Organization. So this takes you through organizing the stamps making the catalog, how to create the catalog. And this, I think, is um, kind of similar to what one of you mentioned about, you see the little star background here. So that actually was in the package with the star stamp. And then you can see I have a little note about this stamp right here that I have lent to Karen also. Um, so, but going in, going into the Learn page is going to, there's going to be a lot of articles, videos, and those kind of things are all linked in here. Um, so that you can see a lot of the stuff that I've talked about is in their paper storage, attaching base units, all that stuff is on that learn page. I hope that helps. All right. Um, Kelly says, I love, love, love the idea of storing stamps. I am a got to have it all um, person <laughs> too much. Do got to have a lot person too much. Do you, have, do you use a copy machine to copy the stamp set sheets? Are you doing something more economical and something I would not have to take my local copy store? Just wondering. Yeah, if you don't have a printer that's also a copier, you can just stamp them out. And remember, it doesn't matter. You're not going for glam on them. So you can just use an inexpensive ink and just kind of power stamp them. You'd have to clean them as you go, though. Um, I did use a copier at the office, though. Uh, Ruby says, hi, Tiffany. Why is it that you start your numbers with Number 101 instead of number one, Ruby. Um, I don't know. I, <laughs> to be honest with you, I think I do that because um, 
when you're cataloging stuff on the computer, if you start with number one, then um, when you get to number 10, number 10 ends up before number one. I don't remember how all that computer stuff works, but now I always do. I always start with n number 101, um, but I don't. There's no real. There's no real method to that madness. It's just one of those weird uh, personality things. Donna says, I see you using Suite 16 and other pages for bulky items. I wonder if the pages bend or flop when you turn the pages as bulky items. I don't actually have any pages yet, so I don't know how much structure they have. Do you have something that keeps them from bending between the sections? I'm sorry, this might not be clear. Um, no, you know, the truth of the matter is there's nothing in them that keeps them bending or whatever that keeps them from bending. But because the scrap rack sits up at an angle, they're laying back and tilted up. So they they don't really, you can put anything, you can put anything in a scrap rack page. It's more, it, it's more an issue of the thickness and some people li like them to stay neater and flatter and tidier, but they really don't, um, it's really not any kind of problem. Now, with that said, I don't know if you all saw the post uh, about doing the double-sided pages. So we're working on some new pages right now that are double-sided. So that will have, um, what we're thinking is the back side will be a um, super single, and then the front side will be smaller pockets. I don't know. I'm waiting. I have one sample set back from the factory, which is that configuration, double extra long, two double extra long pockets on the back, and a super size single on the front. So. We're going to try it with some other pocket configurations. So if you have a fantasy size pocket design, that double-sided page, now this is the same fabric, the same material as our basic storage pages. So the super size single, the double extra long, the sweet 16, that, that page material. So it's not being done with the fabric that the side loader, side loader single is made out of or the embellishment storage pages are made out of. Um, although maybe the new set of Samples that we're working on use the side loader single fabric as the center panel, and we build the double extra long pockets and the super size single pockets on the opposite sides. And we're not sure how that's all going to go together in terms of can we adhere the basic page material to the side loader fabric. So those are kind of all the works. But I guess my point is if there's something you would love to see or some pocket configuration, now you know if you follow along the blog that the triple play, or that if you follow along on Facebook, the triple play pockets and um, the Fantastic Five, and even this idea for double-sided basic storage page pockets, those are all suggestions made by you guys. So we really do listen and we really are interested. So if there's something, and, and your ideas really do come to fruition at the scrap rack. We're, I mean, you're our best market, right? Our best, um, not market, our best, focus group for telling us what works and what you need and what you'd love to have. So I know I'm getting excited again, I'm talking really fast. But if there's a double-sided page that you think, a certain pocket configuration that you would love to have, please, please, please post it up on Facebook so that we can keep track of it and see what other people think. That's the nice thing about Facebook. If you put something up, um, then you can, then other people can comment and say yes or no that they like that idea. Please try to stay positive and kind if you're commenting on Facebook, though. Okay, Mary says, what are the three main sections again, please? So the three main sections for cataloging are going to be themes A to Z, the calendar year, and alphabets and numbers. And I didn't do those in order. So section one, alphanumeric, section two, themes A to Z, and section three is the calendar year. Now, if you're a card maker primarily, that themes A to Z section for you is probably not so much themes as it is as you might be thinking of it as sentiment. So um, if you're a card maker, you're still going to work in three major categories. Now some people consider sentiments the same as themes. So they have birthday in themes A to Z and um, you know retirement in themes A to Z. And I know other people almost have a fifth section that's just sentiment. So that if you're a card maker who thinks that way, the most important thing for you is to be able to find what you need when you need it. So however it is easy for you to think, that's what you want to do. All right, Debbie says, thanks so much for choosing me as today's winner for this class. You're so welcome, Debbie. Thanks for posting your progress. Ruby says, hi again. Thanks so much for all your suggestions. It's so nice to start a project and go directly to the stamp paper, et cetera, that I need. I'm getting so much more done. Yay, Ruby, I love to hear that. That's what keeps me motivated. 
Donna says, can we have another book update? Oh, here's the story on the book. Um, there's some other very exciting things going on here at ScrapRite headquarters that have sort of, um, I did the bones for the book. I, and it's all pretty basic. And the publisher said, you have to have stories. So I, because that's what people find interesting. So I'm kind of a black and white gal. You may have figured that out already. I'm very um, structured and just to the point. And so my little book is structured and to the point. And so what I'm doing right now is integrating stories, success stories, and challenges that people have shared with me. So that's another reason your, face, your post on Facebook and when you tell, kind of give me the whole story on Facebook, all of that stuff could end up somehow in a book as a story substantiating um, my organization theory. But we are working very hard right now on expanding and being able to offer next year um, a website where we don't only talk about craft organization, but where I'm able to actually talk about kitchen organization and bedroom organization and closet organization. Um, so that's that you guys are the first to hear that. And so that's kind of your sneak peek. So there is something big brewing in the scrap rack world. And um, so you all will be the first to know as people who are already part of our email list or our Facebook group or whatever. So but we have some big plans coming up in the new year. Amy says, it's Amy again. I hit enter before I finish my question. I want to continue to use my cabinets in my room for stamping up stamps. Do I use like shelf one for stamping up Christmas? Do I label the clamshells as well as the shelves? You don't need to worry about labeling the shelves. Um, you just, and you don't need to worry about keeping Christmas together. And this, that may have already came through as how I, the last one. Absolutely, you, if you're using your shelves for Stampin' Up! and it works for Stampin' Up! then that's a great place to store them. All you, what you really want to do is make it easy to get to exactly the box you need when you need it. So once you get the clamshells numbered and the examples in your catalog, then when you need a Stampin' Up! Christmas stamp, you don't have to go to that first shelf and pull out every Stampin' Up! box looking for the one you want, because in your catalog, you're going to say, oh, I want the Stampin' Up! Gingerbread House collection. That's number 47. You go right to the shelf, pull off box that's labeled SG47. You have exactly what you need. When you're done with the stamp, you close up the clamshell and put it right back between 46 and 48. So once you get the catalog done, but you don't have to reinvent anything. You don't have to rearrange anything. If you've got them stored in a way that they're visible and accessible, that's half the battle. Just get them cataloged and numbered, and then you can grab whatever you want. Now, stamp it up. Um, maybe somewhere that you can get right off the internet, if you know the number code or the name of the set, right off the internet, you may be able to just go on there and um, collect all the images you have for Stampin' Up! and then put them into a OneNote catalog or put them all on sheets of paper um, and print them out. One of the nice things about photocopying your stamps is you get this, the you can do multiple things without having to clean it, and you get the exact same, the exact size of the stamp. You know exactly how big it is. When you're pulling images off the internet and you're reducing them down so you can fit like 12 stamp sets on a page or whatever, then you don't actually have the dimensions of the stamp accurately. So that's a, something you have to weigh out value-wise. Is it worth it to have the full-size impression of the stamp versus um, being able to put more information on a page. So, and that kind of depends on your personality. Now I have another picture, I, I just saw that somewhere, where a gal took all her stamps and laid them out on a grid, a 12 by 12 grid, and took a picture of them. And that way she was able to have as many stamps on the grid, but looking at that grid picture, even though the picture is only six by six, she knows the approximate size of each one of those stamps um, because they're on that you know, grid that shows the size of them. I hope that makes sense. Julie says, you can unmount the woodblock stamps and convert them to the acrylic block and then put, and then you put the scrap rack stamp section, and that's what I'm doing. Oh, to, yes, unmount, if you have woodblock stamps, I think she's referring back to the fact that I don't buy woodblocks anymore um, because they're hard to store. But if you do have woodblock stamps or you find a woodblock stamp that you love, um, you can unmount it. And I'll tell you something else I learned at one of the shows from a gal who does woodblock stamps is that if you email the company and say, I want this stamp, but I don't want it on the block, a lot of times they'll sell it to you off the block. 
So um, don't be afraid to ask, especially the smaller companies. Now, some companies manufacture in China, and so they don't have that, that opportunity or whatever. Some companies manufacture their rubber parts in China and the wood here because it's hard to import wood into the United States from overseas. Um, so they might they have the rubber the rubber pieces separate anyway. So if you're somebody who likes rubber but prefers to use a clear acrylic block, don't be afraid to ask your favorite stamp manufacturer that does wood block if you can buy just the just the rubber piece. So and we'll save you on some shipping too, I think. Christina says. I print off the image from Cricut.com, um, so I know that images. So I know what images have, and that goes in my catalog. It's so cool. Yeah, it, Christina brings up a good point that I didn't mention. There are lots of great resources for Cricut stuff, and going back to the Facebook group and the Facebook Docs page, and I'm going to see here if I can get in there because I always say this during webinar, and then. Um, so if we go into our group, um, get organized group, and into the files. It used to be called docs, but I think this is called files now. So there's all this information in here. And let's see if anybody has printed. Sometimes link to Cricut Handbook, six per page. Ta-da, let's see where that takes us. Um, but people have done, a lot of people have done the background work on these kinds of things. So um, so this looks like there's a lot of Cricut stuff right here where you're going to be able to find those resources. Yep, there it is. So don't hesitate to go into the Facebook page and find all the different things that you might need because they're probably already there. All the work has probably been done for you. You don't have to search things out. Lakeitha says, um, are you having another buy one, get one for pages? We probably will not have a buy one, get one for pages. Julie says, numbering on the Gypsy. If I number my Cricut impressions and organize those in the Gypsy, they are just listed by name. I'm not sure what the easiest way would be to find them on the Gypsy. Or maybe I would just put the name on the cartridge in the scrap rack and then find it on the Gypsy list. Um, so I would say yes, Julie. I, if you're using your Gypsy, definitely, because you're, yeah, I would take an impression of the cartridge um, and it probably says the name of the cartridge. So on the back of the box, let me go back here to this PowerPoint. Um, so on the back of the box, if you, oops, if you catalog, and I don't think this is actually the back of the box, I think that's another printout, but if you photocopied the back of the box and put it in your scrap rack with the name on this piece, then when you, need it, when you need it in the Gypsy, if that's how they're stored, I'm assuming they store them alphabetically in the Gypsy, I don't really know, um, then you could find them easily. So instead, you might have a number on the box for finding the actual box and connecting that way and also put the name on the impression. That's a good point. Um, I have a post here that just says, Towel Rat from Christy or Christina. I can't see your full name. It probably means that's where the straight eight punches were support, supported on. I think she's right. Marion says, what are your thoughts about unmounting rubber stamps that are on wooden blocks and storing them with acrylic stamps? I can't make myself do this. I would definitely do it. Um, wood block stamps take up so much space. They weigh so much. They're cumbersome. They're hard to work with. So if you can convince yourself to unmount your wood block stamps, I would definitely do it. It's going to save you time. It's going to save you space. You're going to use them more often because they pop up or they're easier to transport and all of those good things. So. If you can force yourself to do it, um, there's been a lot of posts from people in the group over the last two years about unmounting stamps, and it really they've had a lot of success with it. Julie says, I also own a Gypsy and found a site online that has all the cartridge catalogs and downloaded them to my iPad. They are PDF files, so it could be downloaded to anything, and they show all the images for each cartridge instead of just what is on the back of the box. So Julie, if you can um, put that link, put that up on the Facebook group or add it. Um, to the files on Facebook, that would be great. Cricut cartridges are something that people are constantly looking for, so better and better sites evolve for those. So if you have great information, please definitely do post up on Facebook. Teresa says, Tiffany, you mentioned a couple of weeks ago that there are new pages coming for card makers. Will that be before the end of this year? Thanks. I don't know. Um, the prototypes 
have been sent over to the factory and they're working on them and they're exciting and really cool. I'm very excited. There's actually just one. There's only one that we're working on. If that one works, then we'll do more. But I want to get this one out in front of you card makers so that you can tell me what works about it, what you love about it, what other sizes you'd like, and if it's really, it's really cool. And hopefully um, those will come in. We're scheduled right now for the end of December or the beginning of January. And to be honest with you, We've been doing this for it'll be 10 years in March next year. We've never had a shipment that actually arrived with its initial uh, time estimate. But I would assume that they'll be here in January. Anna says, I love this webinar and has really helped me organize my stuff. Yay. Do you think this will work with the digital items too? Any chance of a webinar for digital scrapbookers? It absolutely works for digital. And I have a, a website out that uses OneNote. And OneNote is a program that's in with the Microsoft Office suite. So you, if you have Microsoft Office, you might already have OneNote. But while, I'll send out a link to the OneNote um, video. I'm writing it down right now. So you can watch it. But you can use OneNote and the four-section system to organize all of your stuff. The beautiful thing about digital is if you have something that fits in Christmas and in, um, I don't know, nature and in green, you can store it digitally in all three places really easy. But what you're going to do with OneNote, you tell I'm getting all excited again, right? What you can do with OneNote is you set up all the catalogs or all the pages or dividers in your OneNote notebook. So OneNote is just like a notebook where you have pages. You can scribble on the pages. You add tabs just like a notebook. You can search for things really easy. But So you set that up in the four-section system. And then whenever you buy a digital scrapbook kit, you file it the same way. So your brain doesn't, there's no, you're not separating your mentally, your physical stuff from your digital stuff. You're always looking for Christmas under December. And you're always looking for green under green, whether it's looking in your digital trap rack, or which would be a OneNote notebook, or um, whether you're doing it in your um, physical scrap rack. So. If anybody out there is an app designer and they want to design a digital an app for scrap rack, you'll let me know. Or if you know somebody that's an app designer who wants to design an app for scrap rack, I think that would be really fun. And then it would be easy because we could translate things easily. Um, so uh, Stampin' Up! now has acrylic stamps. Yes. So just. There's my, um, my comment again about not buying wood blocks. Um, Jackie says, I have an idea for the double-sided pages. I've set up a 12 by 12 page holding my scrap. I would love to see the full page in the front and then maybe the back side with a double pocket to hold the smaller scrap. Um, so please post that up on Facebook. You can put it on the regular Facebook page, on our group page. There's also a group called um, New Products Ideas. You can post it there. But we've monitored all of those groups and all those pages for ideas. So please. Get them up. I'm going to write them down, too, when they come up this way. But Valerie says, oh, my God, that is so exciting. I can't wait for more organizing help for my whole house. I can't wait either. I'm totally excited about it. I can hardly stand it. I'm so excited about it. I've been wait, wanting to do it for, for a couple of years since I started teaching webinar and people started asking me. And um, I was at a seminar not that long ago, and we were talking about organization. And someone said, you need to – they said, how do you organize your junk drawer? And I said, I don't have a junk drawer. That would be – Silly, right? Junk falls under the category of miscellaneous. I just want to do a whole um, webinar on or not organizing your junk drawer and, put, and where to put everything so you can find it. I know. I probably will design a junk drawer organizer, though, because I realize that I'm, that's kind of a freakish thing not to have a junk drawer. So, All right. Wanda says, how do I unmount wood block stamps? I have a lot from Club Scraps old kits. And I think the uh, wisdom of the day on unmounting is either to warm them up with a hair dryer or to use undo, which we sell on our website. I think most craft stores carry it. It's UN-DU, um, and people have had great results with that. Or you can just warm it up. Wanda also says, I'm planning to go to Scrapbook Expo in Anaheim early next year. Should I wait to buy my scrap rack there? Do you give great discounts at the shows? Um, we usually have pretty good packages at the shows, pretty good packages of goodies at the shows. Um, you, we will be in Anaheim. I think we posted the 2013 schedule up a week or so ago, so it's on the website now. Um, so the, the, the only thing to consider um, is that Black Friday, 
um, the day after Thanksgiving is free shipping day. So I don't know what your sales tax rate is in Anaheim, but between free shipping and the sales tax, um, it might be valuable for you to buy it on Black Friday also if you're waiting to buy one. So just I guess it depends on how patient you can be. But we do usually have, I don't know what the show special will be next year. This year the show special is gift with purchase. Um, so I think you get like 40 free pages when you buy a particular combination of product at the show. But I don't know what it will be next year. But we do have specials at the show. Akita says, my mistake, buy one page set, get one discounted. It was about two or three months ago. Ooh, the stock up and save sale probably was. Um, we do that every September. And sometimes we do specials on stuff that um, when it comes back in stock or when it's new stuff. So if we have new products that come out in January with our new shipment, then um, you'll see those at that point too. And we are going to do some new travel pack colors. Um, I'm just waiting for fabric samples, but I think they're going to be really cool again. It's going to be so much fun. Terry says, I have also unmounted my Stampin' Up! wheel stamps and find that I use them more. Yeah, once you can put your hands on them more quickly and easily. Thank you for saying that, Terry. That's kind of what I was going back to when the other um, gal asked about, you know, bringing yourself to unmount those stamps. If you can get yourself to do it and they're more visible and more accessible and more affordable, then you're far more likely to use them. So what is the Facebook page connected to? Not sure what that exactly question is, but um, this is the 2011 Get Organized Challenge Group. So if you just search 2011 Get Organized Challenge Group, I'm going to confirm Deborah right now. It's a friend of ours on Facebook. And um, then that will take you in. We also have a Scrap Rack page, just a regular fan page. Um, if you haven't liked us on the fan page, we would love for you to like us on the fan page. And that's how Facebook gets noticed. Um, the more likes you have, then the more your product or your search um, brings people to your site. So if you haven't liked us, please do. Mary says, where do I find the files on Facebook? Which site is it, yours or Scrap Rack? Um, they both look like me, actually. So this picture right here um, is the this is Tiffany Spalding where you see the orange scrap rack. This is an open page, and it is how um, I talk to people in the craft and hobby industry and about the scrap rack. And then we also have the group. So you can join me personally on that Tiffany Spalding page. That's a really general page of information. And then on the group choices, we have the 2011 Get Organized Challenge. We have the Scrap Rack New Products group, and that's where we make suggestions and follow up on suggestions. Here's the one about the dream page. And then we have the Scrap Rack Organizers Club, and so that's just people sharing tips and tricks for getting organized. And we just, um, one of the gals suggested that we have a group where people can actually share what they do, their projects and stuff. We try to keep the scrap rack pages pretty focused on organization, right? We don't, we, <laughs> it's, it's really easy to get inundated with information. Um, so if we try to keep it relevant to organization when we talk about those things. But I just started this group right before, um, right before, see, it's both me, I'm the member in both of those. Right before webinars started, so if people want to share actually projects that they've done or tips or tricks about crafting in general, this is the place to do it. So you can find me at Tiffany Spaulding and look for my picture with the little scrap rack. Um, there is another picture of me that's just like my family Facebook page, which is just a little headshot of me, but the one you want is the scrap rack page. And then, though, then there's links there, too, to the group and stuff. So Gary says, there's a video on YouTube to use the microwave to unmount stamps from wood block. Um, so great, thank you, Jerry, for sharing that. So if you're wondering how to unmount your stamp, uh, Jerry says there's a video on YouTube. So search unmount wood block stamp and the word microwave, and I'm sure it will pop up. Christina says, are you here in Tacoma, and can product be, whoops, can product be picked up at all? Yes, it can be picked up. We don't have any way to process to take money at the warehouse. I mean, there's offices, there's a little office building in the front, and then the warehouse in the back. So if you want to pick something up and you live locally, then you can just place your order on the internet like you normally would, and in the notes box, 
put, I'd love to pick my order up, um, and then Karen won't charge the order until you show up to pick it up, and then she'll take the shipping charges off. Um, we do kind of work funky hours down there, so you just need to let Karen know again um, that, you know, when you want to pick it up, or you can say, please call me to schedule pickup or whatever. She's, she gets there pretty early in the morning, so what we do is any orders that come in before 9 o'clock in the morning, she tries to get processed and on the shipping dock the this, this same day. So she comes in pretty early so she can get everything caught up and out the door early. But she's usually there till at least noon. Um, and so she's the one that you would coordinate with for that. But you absolutely, people pick up there all the time. So yeah. Um, Cindy says, I found a website through Facebook where you can give things away and get things free. It works like eBay using credits instead of cash. I plan to be putting some of my old storage boxes in drawers that are now empty. There is a category for scrapbooking, lots of goodies. Just shop with intention. Yes, thank you so much for adding that, Cindy. Shop with intention. But if you can post that on the Facebook group, that would be great. I mean, that is the perfect way. A lot of people don't like to purge because they feel like they're losing money or that they're being wasteful. And if you can put your stuff off on this kind of site, where you're selling it for credits and then you can buy stuff that you actually need um, and that you actually use because you're shopping with intention, um, that's great. So, um, Cindy, if you could post a link to that on the Facebook group, that would be great. Mary says, I'm sorry, I can't find a page with the groups on it. What is the search string? So if you search 2011 Get Organized Challenge, I know it's not 2011 anymore, but um, but we can't change our group name because our group is too big. So I'm sorry about that. Um, it would be it would be easier if we could change it. Um, but it's just called the 2011 Get Organized Challenge Group. And if you search that, it should pop up for you. So Sherry, I'm confirming you too right now. You just popped up on our friend list too. Um, the site for giving things away is Listia. I'm going to send that to everybody. I think that's a great um, L-I-S-T-I-A. I'm going to check that out myself. So I'm sending this to all of you. Listia is the name of the site. As a matter of fact, I have our group page open. Um, so trade away scrapbook supplies you don't need for something you do need is it oops i'm putting it up right now thank you so much i think this is going to be really helpful is it www.listia.com yep give and get free stuff sweet there it is thank you so much for that suggestion cindy all right it looks like we're at the end of questions for today so with that i'm going to click back here quickly to the PowerPoint slideshow and go back to your assignment for the week, which is to catalog 20 things a day for the next seven days. That's 140 items over the course of the next week. And then as you're working on other projects, I expect that now as you come across things, you'll put them away if they're supplies and you'll catalog them if there's something that needs to be cataloged because now you have a four-section system and you know how everything's going to work. So with that said, I guess it's time to sign off. I've had a great time today. I hope you all have had a great time as well, although I always have a good time on Tuesdays. It's one of the highlights of my week. So great to talk with all of you this morning. Have a wonderful and very productive week, and I will see you next week for Ink Drops and Pens, what to do with all those coloring agents. Thanks so much. Have a great week.